today we are focusing on mastering the cover letter. Um, and because I've had a theme of doing things in tens, we're going to take 10 approaches to try in your next uh, job application with your cover letter. Um, I'm also going to share with you other videos that we've done on cover letters. There's a whole suite of stuff that you can take a look at that covers the same sort of genre. For those of you who weren't at the morning session, I am Dr. Joseph Barber. I am the Director of Graduate Career Initiatives at Penn Career Services. I oversee two of the teams working with graduate students and postdocs. We covered already um, in the last session what a resume is. It's a customized, skills-focused document that can be tailored to different job applications that really forefronts relevant skills for the role that you're applying to. The one thing that the resume doesn't really do well is it, it doesn't really sound a lot like you, right? You never describe yourself in a conversation with someone as a list of punchy bullet points triggered by skills, right? Someone says, tell me about yourself. You don't just list off things like research this, I've done this, I've done this. You don't, you're not a shopping list, you're a person. You have a, a complex integrated narrative that you have. And the resume by its style is, is not about that. So. Um, th there's no there's no inner workings of you sort of represented in the resume. And this is where the cover letter can have much more of an impact because they are sort of why documents, you know, why are you doing all these things? Why have you done these things? Why are these things even relevant to the role that you're applying to? Why do you even want this role? Um, and so the you, you definitely want to use these documents differently. You definitely want the resume to be skills focused and you definitely want the cover letter to add value to that document by giving the reader um, not different information, because you definitely want them to be uh, connected, but a different layer of information, different insight into you as, as a person and how you approach things. And that's what the cover letter can, be, can begin to do. So it is narrative. It's written in a narrative form. It's paragraph and not bullets. Sometimes you'll see people talk about uh, cover letters where you, you summarize some of your main skills in bullet form. Um, whilst that may be perfectly great, great, I have, you know, I have no evidence to say that's not, it's not the style that I recommend because the resume already does that. It's already bulleted. I think you want to use the cover letter in its most narrative form to really get across the stories about you and how you approach the work that you've done, right? The inner workings of your mind is sort of what you want to cover um, in, the, in the cover letter. It is a document that allows you to be a little bit more uh, emotional, um, professionally emotional in terms of think, talking about things that excite you and things like that. And we'll touch on that as we go through this. Um, in terms of overall formatting, um, you know, a one-page cover letter is ideal. I've seen, you know, cover letters for academic jobs spreading over three pages, and that's a lot. Um, now, that's asked for for academic jobs, so I don't feel sorry for the search committees because they're asking for this information. But in most other cases, a one-page version of your cover letter is going to be what you're aiming for here. Um, I mentioned at the beginning some of the other videos that are out there. So in the links that I shared in the in the chat, and I'll just put those again, just in case people coming into the session don't see the old ones that I posted. Uh, you can find links to these um, to these videos. They cover very similar topics because the, the cover letter is an interesting genre to do, but they will give you slightly different perspectives of what those look like. Um, cover letters are much less structured than resumes. You know, resumes have sections, education, experience, and skills. Uh, cover letters don't really have that. So it, it's understandably more complicated to say, well, what do I need to get to, to do with this document? And hopefully through the, the videos that I'm sharing here and through some of the information that I'm sharing today, you'll have a little bit more confidence about how you can approach that. But I'm going to cover sort of both the nuts and bolts of the formatting and a little bit of the content at the same time. So let's start off with formatting, right? Because the cover letter is its own genre of, of information. One of the things I, I often notice when people share with me resumes and cover letters is that they come across looking very different, right? So they're different formatted, different fonts, different sizes, different margins. Um, does that really matter? And I guess the answer is no, but to a certain extent, you are creating a narrative about yourself, uh, an identity, a professional identity. And, and you know, if you want that identity to be uh, one that where you have strong attention to detail and where you are you know, able to um, communicate effectively, then I would say aligning your formatting just makes the document look more professional, uh, right? So here you can see the differences. Here's me aligning it just so that it's the same information, but just you know, the same format. And, and it, it makes it easier uh, for the reader to sort of see these information, see this information is connected as opposed to totally different, right? Because if I'm switching over from font sizes and margins, it creates a, a barrier, almost a cognitive barrier in my head because I'm, I'm looking at these as different documents as part or instead of being a, a part of a cohesive whole. Uh, content information, these are some of the basics, but we'll, and we'll get into the meat uh, a little bit later on, but it, you know, it, I see many cover letters where a third of the page is taken up by things like your addresses, your address and their address. And then you start the, the cover letter sort of two thirds of the, or a third of the way down. 
And if you're going for a one page version that limits the amount of narrative that you can create about yourself you know, in a one page version. So in today's uh, age, no one is gonna write to you. Literally no one is gonna send you a letter. And so giving your address doesn't seem to be necessary, right? This is how I was told to write letters, formal letters that you post. No one's doing that anymore. Also sharing your personal address with random people, I feel like is something that we should all try to do less of. And so uh, eliminating that is gonna be, uh, you know, okay. Also, they know where they work. So telling them that they are Apple and they, they work in you know, this place doesn't give them any information that they need. Uh, and all the people, recruiters and, and, and HR professionals looking at this probably come from a generation where sending things in the post hasn't been done for a long time anyway. So you know, get rid of things that you don't need in cover letters and in resume so that you can really prioritize the information that you do need. And what you do need is an address and a phone number, uh, sorry, an email address and a phone number. I'm not a big fan of having people phone me. Um, if they I much prefer people email me and then I can think about stuff. But when you're applying for a role, you want to make it easy for people to communicate with you. Uh, so sometimes I do see people dropping off the phone number because probably like me, they just don't want people to phone them. But because you want people to reach out to you and say, we'd love to offer you an interview, you know, are you interested? A adding any form of communication that allows that to happen is going to be helpful. One email address, one phone number, uh, make sure that they can find you there. And what I tend to do with cover letters is I tend to bookend the content information at the top in my, you know, where my name is, and I bookend it at the bottom. So it's the last thing that they read in the cover letter too. The subliminal efforts of saying, you should really reach out and, and communicate with me. I'm happy to, to chat with you, right? So bookending it on either side is gonna be important. It's also important to have your name at the top and not just at the bottom. Some people have their name only in the signature, but the way that uh, at least I read documents is I need to know whose document it is at the top and then I read down, it's it sort of, it, it, it um, disrupts the flow to, for me to jump down to the bottom to see what it is to jump back up to the top. So name at the top is gonna to be very easy to just to get, make sure that people know who you are. Then we have the greeting line and people I think spend a lot of time wondering about who should I send this letter to? Who should I address it to? Does it matter? Um, you know, the, the typical opening lines for a cover letter are the dear or the to, right? Dear Joseph or to the hiring manager. So if, if, it's, an, if it's a group or an entity, you know, hiring manager isn't a person, it's sort of an entity, then I think two is fine. I don't think you want dear hiring manager because it's sort of, it's a slight mismatch there. Dear is a, you know, as I was writing this, it, it just seemed weirder and weirder uh, every time I said it in my head, the word dear and how that sounds, but that's, that's perfectly fine. What I would avoid is anything like to whom it may concern because it suggests that you have no idea who's going to be looking at this, right? Anyone who reads this, you know, take note. And then something like dear sir or madam is a very traditional way of doing it, but it's a very gendered way of doing it. Uh, and so just removing all gendered uh, aspects of your salutation, I think is gonna be important. So hiring manager is not gendered. It's also not role specific. I can be a hiring manager, even in my current position. It doesn't change my title. It's what I am during the hiring process. So even if you are a senior scientist, you can also be the primary hiring manager. So you can apply that term to different people. So if you're looking for not using a name, then uh, hiring manager is sort of my, my go-to one of doing that. Does it matter if you don't have a name, right? So if there's a name associated with it, if there's a recruiter's name associated with the job, then I would say use the name that's right in front of you because at some point they will look at that application. Uh, you can look at an organization structure and you might be able to ascertain who the hiring manager is, who the person you'll be you know, reporting to in the role is, and you can use their name too and not use the recruiter's name because at the end of the day, a letter is going to be read by so many different levels, depending on the organization, a recruiter, uh, you know, staff, the hiring manager, um, HR people, they're all going to have sort of a, a look at this um, and then be able to see, you know, and so even if you have a name, at some point, someone who's not that person is going to be uh, looking at it. So either go for the recruiter that you know, or the hiring manager, if you have some certainty, and this is where your networking might help uh, to figure out who that is. Um, but don't over fixate on it. It's fine. People will not over fixate on your salutation line. Uh, question came in for the email. Should we use the email from our current position or a personal email or both? I would only say one email just because otherwise the person has to sort of figure out which one that is. And they might email one one time and another time, another time. Um, pen email addresses come with a branding aspect to it. So if you're applying for an organization that has hired pen people and your email is a pen email address, then it, it, it's associated with that. Obviously your resume will say that you're from pen as well, but there's branding associated with that. So I, I typically go for a pen one um, because you are meant to be getting a job leaving pen. So using your pen email address is perfectly fine. If you are concerned that you will lose your pen email address because you have graduating or leaving your position, 
then I would obviously go for a personal one that's going to stay, um, you know, st stick stick around with you. Um, so you need to know from your department or your school how long your email address stays with you uh, once you leave and move forward. Um, opening lines also very important um, because there's a lot of uh, not a lot of, but there's a discussion about how to do a cover letter, right? Do you start off very simply uh, and standard way, and some people say boring way, or do you try to make it exciting and capture the interests of people? This is a common starting line. I'm writing to express my interest in applying for the position. Um, what you're really doing is you're applying for it. So I would even simplify the starting line you know, slightly more. I'm applying for the consulting role. But what I would tend to add to this um, is where you saw the job advertised. It's really not for your benefit to add this information. It's really for the hardworking HR and recruiter staff who've spent lots of hours thinking about how to find the right pipelines of candidates. And if you can illustrate in your letter where you saw that from, that provides them with useful information that they're like, oh, great, I'm glad we posted it there because that's where you saw it. I'm glad it was on Handshake or I'm glad I did this. So yes, it's very standard and it doesn't necessarily add you know, value to you, but it's helpful to them. And it's helpful to them as well because it lists the position right up front. I've seen many cover letters where people have tried to make it more, uh, you know, this hook at the beginning to capture people's interests. And it takes a whole paragraph for me to figure out what job they're applying to, right? So you might start off with, you know, with a dynamic interest in X and Y and because of this, and then right at the end of that paragraph, it says, you know, I'm excited by to apply for this position. So there's a lot of information as I'm reading a paragraph like that, that I'm not paying attention to necessarily because I don't know what position that you're applying to. But if I know the position as the reader that you're applying to, anything that you say next, gets associated with that position. So you can certainly take different approaches in your letter. Uh, there's lots of different ways of doing that, but I would err on stating the job up front and stating where you, you got it next. Within that opening paragraph then, this is also another common thing that I see, right? People will say, I'm, I'm graduating, I have this degree, I'm a postdoc. I believe that my combination of research and business skills will be a great fit for this role. The challenge of this line is, in this paragraph right now, I don't know what that combination of research and business skills actually looks like. I don't know the value of that because I only have what you've written in that uh, entry paragraph. And if I haven't looked at your resume yet, which you don't know if they have, uh, I won't have any more information. And so your belief statement, I believe this is important, isn't going to be shared by the person reading it. They will not share in that belief. So the, the, the trick here is to make sure that you provide enough information, a summary of information before you make the belief statement so that they too can share in that belief statement, right? So don't assume that they know what your research and business skills are, state them in summary form up front and then describe them in more detail in the rest of the, the cover letter. Um, so this is a sort of an alternative version of that where um, you know, what I've tried to do here with three years of experience coordinating research projects using innovative approaches and with hands on consulting experience as a project manager. I'm excited to bring my passion to this role, or you can even say, I believe that this combination of skills and experiences will be a good fit for this role. So that having that sort of summary up front really make sure that the reader knows that you have what they're looking for. And then when you say, I believe, or, you know, this is what I'm going to bring, they, they understand that much more specifically. In terms of structuring your letter, if you can create a summary, so you say what you're applying for and then create a summary of what you bring to the role, relevant skills and experiences specific to the role, the rest of the letter then goes into more detail about those elements. The first paragraph after that opening paragraph should probably be your impact paragraph, right? So if we sort of break down the cover letter into different components, summary comes first, then illustrations of your experiences in the middle, and then the last one is, you know, why this job? Um, after you've given your summary, you don't want necessarily to start off with something, you don't want to have to go back all the way to, um, you know, an undergraduate, as an undergraduate, I did this, because that may not be your most relevant experience, right? You really want to make sure that the most relevant thing comes first to hold their attention. However, if your undergraduate experience, for example, was the most relevant, there's nothing wrong with necessarily starting with that and then broadening out your, your sort of chronology to, with other relevant experiences that are, uh, that are out there. But don't feel like you're locked into either doing reverse chronological, here's where I am and here's where I have been, or actual chronological, starting in the past and moving forward. Really um, uh, adjust the narrative so that as you look at the job description, as you look at the skills that they're looking for, the thing that you give an example about in that second paragraph is the most dynamic. Because if you can hold their attention through the first half of your letter by illustrating relevant skills, then you've, you've, you've hooked them in that way, right? You, you can then have other paragraphs that are you know, more transferable skills or more general skills, but that first half of the letter is gonna be really strong and really aligned with what they're looking for. 
So here's an example. Again, it's very hard to make up a, a cover letter um, for someone who I'm not for a role that I'm not applying for. But just as an example, you might start off with that, that paragraph. You know, I've always sought out research areas and leadership roles. During my PhD, I've developed new uh, protocols as part of three research projects. I've taken every opportunity to uh, keep the tools I'm developing um, at the cutting edge, right? So this narrative, for example, might fit where I'm identifying leadership roles and new ideas and new protocols. Uh, cutting edge research might fit a role like this, right? Where they're looking for cutting edge technologies and novel things and working closely with people and next generation research, right? So if my research or your research is the thing, you know, the, the way that you're doing your research, the way you're approaching is the thing that's most exciting to them, then obviously it's a good fit because it speaks very uh, directly to the role uh, that, they're, that you'd be applying for. These middle paragraphs then are all about telling stories. Um, so when we talk about interviewing tomorrow, we'll talk about the STAR framework, situation, task, action, result, to really help you structure some of your interview answers. You can do somewhat similar things in a cover letter too, because in a resume, you are sort of stating facts very plainly. Led team of five people to do this thing that resulted in this thing, right? It's, it's not really a story. It's just a statement of a skill being used in a context. In a cover letter, you don't have to repeat that. In fact, you shouldn't repeat exactly the same thing that you've written in a resume, because then why the point? What, what's the point of having two documents? What you can do is you can take a slightly different approach. So in the resume, rather than saying led team to do this thing that resulted in this thing, you could say, well, when I was leaving the team, one of the most exciting parts of that project was this. Or one of the most challenging parts of the project I faced as a leader was this. And so what I did was that. Right? And so the task, or as I prefer to frame it as the challenge, allows you to begin to tell stories because what a story is, is a, a way of communicating with a little bit of drama associated with it that holds your attention, a little bit of, uh, holds your attention because it has some tension, right? So there's, there's drama that makes the story engaging. That's why the narrative form of the cover letters is so important because you can integrate some of those things into your own uh, narrative as you're creating that. So sticking with this same paragraph that I had earlier, I've talked about sort of novel research. I've you know, described it in general in the first part of this paragraph. Then I'm going to tell a sort of a mini story about it. <clears throat> One of my most challenging projects, development of these systems. We didn't have any of these tools. <gasps> That's the drama. We didn't have any of it. What were we going to do? And then you tell them what you did, right? So what I had to do is develop new relationships with faculty. Uh, and then I was able to implement their software. Um, and now we're able to, to publish the data, right? So it's a, a two sentence or a three sentence story, it's small. It adds an element of drama in there because that's what holds the reader's attention, but it also gives them insight into how you approach things, right? I'm not, I'm not afraid of reaching out and having conversations with people. I'm, I'm interested in novel things. I want to look at a problem and come up with novel solutions, right? This is your inner workings being illustrated, uh, which can be really helpful. Again, this is a job description where some of those experiences may be valuable, right? We want people who have bold ideas, who uh, want to foster collaborations, who are excited about building new things um, and, and being independent, right? So again, the story that you tell should be the story that you are most excited to tell that's also most relevant to the role that you're applying to. So that gives you, you know, several options from your experience to pick from as you are telling these stories uh, in, in your paragraph. Now these things too, right? So this job description, being passionate about new ideas, uh, helping others, learning from those experiences. Uh, we can touch on those in, in uh, uh, the, the paragraph that I'm gonna come back to in a segment as well. Now, I totally overthought this uh, boat here. This is an eight, so I thought number eight would be a great image to use this for, but then I realized that there are nine people in this boat and so that created some cognitive dissonance for me. So I just wanna let you know that this was a long, thought out process uh, that I had here. Um, adding to the STAR framework, uh, the things that I often suggest are, are two more that turn it from STAR to STARA, even better STAR. And those are sort of emotions and, and, and sort of the relevance of the role, right? So the emotions are the things that you are feeling from doing that. So if you say, uh, you know, one of the most exciting aspects of the project, you are linking the, the project to, you know, a positive emotional state, a subjective state that you are experiencing. If you say that this project was satisfying or that I learned a lot from this and I really appreciated that, then you're getting at uh, a, a sort of this emotional level that you can't really, maybe emotions is the wrong word, but sort of an energizing level that you, um, that you can't get to in the cover letter, uh, sorry, in the resume. None of the bullet points in the resume can start off by saying, 
excitedly collaborated with three people, right? It just doesn't make sense in a resume format. But in a cover letter, you can really explain why you're excited by it and what you learned from it and what you took away from that. And that can be so valuable because, again, the reason that people want to interview you primarily is because you have the skills to do the job, but also because the way that you approach the job, your cultural competencies, your uh, emotional intelligence, those things resonate with the people who are going to be looking at your materials, right? So if you can get to that, then what you're doing is you're building on the solid structure of the resume with more information about you, more meaningful information about you that you're you're then going to lean into even more when you get to the interview and you can tell uh, you know even more um, in depth stories about your experience. So energy and emotion, right? So I really enjoyed learning these skills. I really enjoyed, right? You can say that in a cover letter and you should, if you enjoyed something or excited by it, you should. You don't want to go overboard on emotions, but you should create an energy. If you're a hiring manager and you're reading, you know, 40 applications a day, which is hard, anything that brings energy is going to be um, energizing. It's going to be helpful. It's going to be positive. Um, and, you know, I've enjoyed forming what's already been a wonderfully productive collaboration, right? So even just wonderfully productive. I'm not saying that you need to use language like that, but uh, exactly. But the idea is it, it elevates the, the sort of the, um, the illustration of what you're doing. If I just said, this has been a great collaboration or this collaboration has helped us lead to data, you know, that doesn't, it doesn't sort of create an energy around it. But if I call it a wonderfully productive collaboration, you're associating yourself with, a, associating yourself with an energy that I think the reader can really resonate with. Um, so these are just examples of, of some of the, the, the types of language that you might be able to integrate into a cover letter as part of your narratives, as part of your storytelling. It was exciting, it was challenging, it was satisfying, it was wonderful. This meant a lot to me, right? If you can reflect on an experience and say, this meant a lot to me because of this, and that's why I'm so excited about this new role because then you're connecting the, the dots, right? So the, 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 uh, the last category of my STARA framework was relevance. Right, so you're you're tying in the stories that you're telling, you're making them emotionally relevant, and then you're connecting them back uh, to the job itself. So you know that's going to be helpful. Um, I'm passionate about some many jobs. Talk about you know we must have a passion about X, and you can't really just say I'm passionate about something and have that be your passion because you know it's the least passionate way of saying that you're passionate about something is simply by saying oh yes I'm I'm passionate about animal welfare. Right, so you really have to illustrate what the passion looks like, how you've approached that, what have you done to really feed into that passion? What does that look like for you? And again, it's not your own passions, it's, it's the passions that you're gonna be sharing with the job that you're applying to that you really want to, uh, to highlight. Other words that have energy, innovation, uh, dynamic, novel, cutting edge, unique, right? These are all things that, that you can think about integrating into a narrative that I think that will be helpful. Okay, so I chickened out on having the eight just be the eight, and I also have it as a nine because I thought uh, uh, I'm going to hedge my bets there, just so you know. Um, last paragraph then for the cover letter, very important. So two thirds or three quarters of the letter should be about what you bring to the role, right? That's what the reader wants to know from the get go. Do you have the skills, the interest, the experience to do this role? The last paragraph can be more about what you hope to gain from doing this role, right? This is your personal connection. It's important to do it this way around because if you start off by saying, you know, I really want this role because it's really going to help me grow, they don't care about that at that point. You know, if this is the first document that they're reading, if you say it up front, it doesn't mean anything because they're not invested in you, right? They, they, they don't know if you even have something to bring to the role. So why would they necessarily care about how much you're excited by the position? But if you can illustrate what it is that you bring in terms of all these relevant skills and stories that you're telling, and then say at the end, I'm so excited about this role because then they are invest invested in you. They know that you have skills, they know that you have a value. So making sure that you sort of, um, you know, make, uh, have that last paragraph be very rich in terms of what that looks like for you and, and what that, um, you know, how your, how the experiences that you've highlighted might uh, echo what you're saying there. So again, if you've networked with people, talking about networking again and have uh, chatting with people in different organizations and understand the nature of the role, but also understand the culture of the organization, you can probably find something authentic to say about it. You know, I, it's great to hear that you do X. It's great to know that some of your projects focus on Y. I love that you have a mentoring program for new, um, you know, for new staff members. I've always valued mentoring. And so this is even more exciting for me that I can bring my skills to a role where, that, where that's a key part of the fabric of the role, right? So it's authentic. Don't say I want to work here because you're the best company in the world, because that's not really authentic. It's not, it's very flat. It's very two dimensional. It's not a, it doesn't resonate with the things that you probably have said in your letter uh, or, you know, that you say about yourself. So, 
if you don't have anything authentic to say, and for some jobs you just really may not, then you know, say, say, say less. If you do have something authentic to say, then this is a great opportunity to name drop and to really identify what you know about the organization to illustrate why it's a good fit for you and why you're a good fit uh, for that role itself. And then uh, finally, the sort of the interplay between cover letters and resumes. Um, this is something that a recruiter once said to us, and I kept the quote um, because you know, it's important. They said, I just, I don't read cover letters. And that person will never read a cover letter. And it could be the best cover letter in the world and they still won't read it because they make their judgments based on something else. Now, this is a, you know, N of one in this sample as it were. So uh, across the spectrum of recruiters and hiring managers, who knows how many really find value in the cover letters. What that means from your perspective though, is that um, you can't just customize and create a perfect cover letter and have a generic resume. You can't mention things in the cover letter that aren't also echoed in some way or reflected in some way in the resume. You need both documents to sort of be equally weighted in terms of having the information that you want to get across, but to present that information differently. So it's not just the same information twice. That's why the cover letter adds layers onto what's already in the resume, but it's not new information. Because if it is only in the cover letter and no one reads it, it's not gonna help you, right? It doesn't help you at all. And in fact, when um, you know, we talked about applicant tracking software last time, when companies scan keywords from application materials and compare them with the keywords in the job descriptions, they usually only scan the resumes because the resumes are a standardized, as it were, document, whereas the cover letters can be all over the place. And so the cover letters aren't scanned and they may not be read. So it's so important to have a good cover letter. It really adds value, uh, but you don't know who's gonna read it or in what order they're gonna read it. Because this was also a quote from a recruiter, or could be a hiring manager, I think, uh, about cover letters, right? They are essential. We make our interview selections based on them. You just don't know. You don't know. Um, uh, you don't know who's going to be the, the person reading it. Uh, and so uh, this is a good way of, of making sure that by writing a good cover letter, if someone does read it, they really find value in that process. Um, someone did ask if, if the slides are going to be available. Uh, I can make the slides available as part of the, the resources once the video is posted. Um, you will we'll, we'll connect the slides to that video as well. So you can definitely have access to those. If you need them sooner, you can email me directly. So again, a resume, illustration of your skills, your, all the technical skills, all the relevant skills, cover letter, more narrative form of here's how I use this. Here's, here's why I gained these skills. Here's what I enjoyed by using these skills in different settings. And then really talking to you know, how your skills and experiences connect to that uh, employer in particular. This was another uh, thing I found on LinkedIn. I always like to show up there because I think it's important. Um, I dis discard 99% of, of people who have no cover letters. This person wants a cover letter, but they also don't want a generic cover letter. If your cover letter says, it's clear that you're looking for a candidate that's extremely familiar with the responsibilities associated with the role and can perform them confidently. Given these requirements, I'm certain I have the necessary skill to do the job and perform above expectations. They don't want templated language. They want your language. They want your, they want insight into you, right? So this is just another example of, of what to avoid uh, in a cover letter. Let's wrap up our time together with some resources. Some of these we saw last time. So we have an application materials um, page on our website. You can take a look at that um, before people pop off. Let me put the, the links in the chat again. Um, we have our vault guides, which also cover cover letters. Uh, in particular, you can take a look at some of the suggestions there. We talked about Big Interview. They have a resume curriculum, but they also have a 10-minute um, uh, video here on writing persuasive cover letters. Again, different insights, different approaches. They won't all match what I've said, but your job is to sort of accumulate all this knowledge and, and find an approach that works best for you uh, as well. Imagine PhD for Humanities and Social Sciences has uh, examples of cover letters for different career fields and different job families. Um, and then uh, Aurora also has information on writing cover letters. So again, all these links are in the, the session uh, today. That you, uh, Sorry, all these links are in the links that I put in the chat today, and you can take a look at those. Um, and they have a guide that walks you through how to write a cover letter. So a bit more structured approach to breaking down your skills and figuring out what that, uh, what that looks like. I wrote a blog post on the STAR model and the STAR approach. You can just read that uh, if you want to get a sense of what I was getting at there, but I covered most of it today, I think. And then once again, don't forget LinkedIn Learning. So many resources on cover letters that you can take a look at uh, that will add value to your understanding of what you're doing. <laughs>